Uh, today, we somehow wanted to sum up this whole uh, discussion, particularly on parts of uh, China talk um, and uh, China's portion of these uh, web talks. And it's, um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to have uh, two outstanding speakers joining us today. Uh, Martina is um, representing uh, on, from both sides of Atlantic, basically. Martina is originally from Slovakia, but uh, she uh, works in Washington for SIDE, uh, the organization that has a long record of working on corrosive capital and Chinese uh, economic power in the world, not just in my part of the world, but uh, much uh, wide, in a much wider uh, geography. Martina herself concentrates her work on the responses to global strategic threats, economic um, the misconceptions, responsible economic policies, corrosive capital, entrepreneurship ecosystems, and private sector leadership in advancing democracy and markets. In 2019, Martina testified on Russia's economic footprint in the Western Balkans on uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, and this is particularly important for us, although Martina comes from Slovakia, works in Washington, but she is a big expert on both on uh, Balkans, and we did not have any talk about Balkans, so it will be particularly interesting for us to hear the perspectives from the uh, uh, from the uh, Balkan countries' uh, point of view. Don Notok is the uh, is our. Um, uh, another speaker. He is currently strategic communications expert at the European External Action Service, working on emerging threats and foreign interferences. He was previously a member of the Cabinet for European Commission, Vice President for Digital S Single Market, being among other things responsible for coordinating the European Union's work on countering disinformation. Before that, he advised the Estonian government and the Prime Minister on communication. Tauno has lived in China and given lectures on Chinese contemporary politics at the uh, Estonian universities. Uh, and uh, as it is clear, he comes from Estonia, and obviously it's also symbolic that we've started with Estonia, the very first webinar, and we are finishing with the Estonian um, experts uh, on our last one as well. Ani Kinturashvili is our uh, researcher um, at Civic Idea. Uh, she works uh, specifically on Chinese influences and ch uh, Chinese uh, power uh, in, in Georgia. And as I've uh, mentioned uh, before, we uh, widened our work to Central Asia as well. So she will be um, contributing with, uh, with the experiences from, from this uh, particular parts of the world. Um, so to start this discussion, I, um, uh, I want to ask a very general question from the beginning to get your uh, initial feed, uh, feedback and comments. Uh, as, as I've already said, the Chinese influence power and Chinese influence operations were, were occupied big parts of our discussion from the very first day to the, uh, to the last the ninth webinar. We were talking about the start of the virus, the implications of it, the reactions all over the world, the actions from China itself, the ways uh, the information was manipulated, and also the kind of uh, response from Moscow to whatever was said uh, in, in Beijing or by Beijing. The, uh, one of the patterns that we discovered, for example, was the fact that Sputnik and Russia Today and some other well-known Russian disinformation agents are actually one of the most frequently read tweeters, reposters, uh, sharing the news is whatever comes from Beijing and whatever is said by Beijing. Basically, those two are working together and uh, bringing the information together. We in Georgia have experienced this kind of a joint effort ourselves. And the Luger Lab was uh, the uh, high topic of discussion over the years, since 2011, that it was open. Uh, Russians, uh, and particularly and specifically uh, Minister Lavrov, were personally involved in spreading all those rumors and disinformation and being actually the anchors of the disinformation campaign against it. But what was different in these times was that a Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs started to talk together with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs exactly with the same language, exactly about the same issue, and naming exactly the same uh, 
uh, examples as the Moscow is using. So it was the, for the first time when we openly actually faced this uh, stream of Chinese campaign involving Georgia. Uh, so that was by itself a pretty interesting uh, case for, for us to observe what was the reaction of my government, uh, how they managed this, uh, this situation with the uh, Chinese authorities. But um, regardless of the Georgia case, uh, Taono, I wanted to ask you first um, as, as to uh, the ways, uh, particularly within the European Union, how, what was the reaction? What is the reaction? What is to expect? For example, um, we remember beginning of the year, uh, Huawei, for example, not being an issue in the European Union, different from the United States. And now, uh, country after another, declining the cooperation on 5G technologies with the Chinese companies. This is just one example of the changing mood and attitudes within the European Union. So if you can tell us a little bit more about it and also why we should talk about China at all. What is it that makes the case particularly interesting and important in these times? Yes, I think that there's of course plenty of reasons to, to talk about China. And then uh, also coming from a country that is, um, that is next to Russia, uh, I also understand why, why in, 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 in many of those countries, uh, Russia is the existential question and China is somewhere uh, more an abstract uh, kind of entity somewhere in, 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 in a distance. Um, but, uh, and, and China also, I think, uh, for the EU and then talking about the influence side of things is, uh, is a relatively uh, new topic because I remember when we were putting together the, the action plan against disinformation in 2018, um then then china was not yet uh, an issue in that context to actually talk about it was still uh, the, the main and pretty much the only foreign actor that concerned the eu and the EU's, that that endangered the eu's democracies was russia and and so the last 6 months or the last year has 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 changed in general, I think the view on, on, on China uh, quite a lot. As you mentioned, the, the 5G and Huawei issue was, was one of the wake-up calls that actually, I think it also it was, a, it was one of the issue, topics that, that launched the influence topic into, into the media and also into the kind of the mainstream awareness. Uh, on, from the policy makers side, of course, uh, dealing with China, the, the, the awareness was there also, also from earlier. But why I talk about China is, is that, that Chinese decisions affect us all more and more, even, even if, if you are far away. Take just the uh, latest example from, uh, from this week is uh, that the, the Hong Kong national security law, which according to, to some interpretations could apply globally, Making it theoretically illegal for anyone in the world to 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 go against these clauses. We have already seen one uh, country advising their citizens in 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 a travel advice to to be careful when criticizing China on social media, lest they might be charged under the law when when they happen to visit Hong Kong or happen to be in Hong Kong. So this is one example of of uh, of China. Chinese global relevance, why, why we need to talk about it, and also China intentionally or unintentionally deterring criticism of the country's action beyond its borders. Um, and also what we have seen during the COVID pandemic is, is that, that Beijing has been working hard to control the narrative of, of, on, on the pandemic. Uh, and also use the pandemic to to promote its uh, governmental system to show how it's working better than uh, compared to democracies. But of course, uh, also why we need to continue talking about China is because uh, China is still an important economic player for 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 all of us, and uh, and that on the other hand also that solving certain global issues when we talk about climate climate crisis and biodiversity crisis will need China's participation and thus uh, continued engagement with China. On what terms, that's another question. And now coming to the area that I work in is, is, is the, 
disinformation and more generally the foreign interference and manipulation of the information sphere, we have Jin China's uh, increasing assertiveness, which is visible in, in, in the social media activities of, of Chinese officials, for example. They seem to be willing, increasingly willing to attack uh, individual countries, to share rumors, to share conspiracy theories. The one that you mentioned about the Luger Lab is, 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 is one of the examples where we also see actual alignment with, uh, with Russia's activities. This is not necessarily evidence of coordination, but we see that, that, that um, there is at least certain interaction on the level of, of messages. And we also just published actually this week a short article about this on, on the EU versus disinfo website. So, so this is so, so uh, the disinformation side. While, while China is is uh, definitely not on the same level on disinformation as as Russia, and and uh, and it's a r relatively new player in the disinformation uh, uh, space. We saw only the first. A network takedown on, on the Western social media platforms uh, last August in context of Hong Kong and now the next one uh, on Twitter, uh, a Chinese China attributed network uh, beginning of this uh, June. Uh, so so, so we, we, we see that China is entering the kind of the Russia style disinformation field but it's still the sophistication is different, the motivation is different, but but what what needs to be said in this context is also that China is much more than a disinformation actor, because disinformation uh, is just a part of, of its wider influence toolbox, um, and arguably still a, a smaller part. Um, one of the characteristics you might have talked about it also in in, in one of the previous previous meetings is that that what also distinguishes China, for example, from Russia that exploits that has been exploiting divisions in the societies where they where they practice disinformation is that Chinese narratives often concern themselves, concern things happening in China, uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and so on. And and this kind of this is this is very different from from uh, from from what Russia has been doing. Of course, with China, we have also seen it changing recently with focus. On the uh, on the Black Lives Matter protests in the U.S., for example, um, and there hasn't been much focus on China's propaganda propaganda activities before because they have not been very effective, arguably at least in the West, and and also everybody is doing it. That everyone is trying to launch positive narratives about themselves, every country. But what distinguishes China in this also is that while promoting their narratives, positive narratives of themselves, they have been also practicing suppression of information and suppression of criticism. So on one hand, we have reputation building, which many countries do. On the other hand, it's the, it's the same, the positive propaganda, but in com combination with suppression of critical voices. And the suppression part is extremely important because propaganda becomes something else when it's combined with suppression of information. And that's also what distinguishes China from others. So, and this is also where the media freedom question comes in, because uh, suppression of information has, has always been a part of Beijing's toolbox. We all know about Chinese domestic censorship, but we see uh, the aim of China to also control information outside of their borders. And we also hear about increasingly difficult conditions for foreign correspondents. Uh, in China, we, we know that 19 correspondents have had to leave China over the over the past 12 months, which uh, impacts an important source of a remaining important source of uh, independent information from the country, and uh, that could kind of lead us to a question: where will where will this go in the end? We are st still far from it. Could be that there is no alternative source or no source of independent information from the country. That CCP could theoretically act as a gatekeeper to all information that about what is happening inside China, and that then, in context of, of the global expansion of Chinese state media, which we are already seeing. So, and if your goal as a country is shape how do people talk about you, how they view your country, what information they consume about it, 
then combining these two things, you, you, you will already have achieved a big portion of, of, of your goal with that. And even, I mean, on the practical side, even for our policy decisions, not just us, but, but in general, we very much rely on, 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 on foreign media and then media reports uh, from China. Another issue, maybe what, what maybe also needs to be talked about, is, is the um, increasing global spread of Chinese platforms and technologies. We are, we are already seeing some of Chinese online platforms and, and uh, services becoming part of mainstream use in many countries. Talking about social media platforms, for example, TikTok comes from a totally different context compared to existing platforms like Facebook or Twitter. It comes from a different norms and legal background. And the question that this brings along is what are the implications of that different origin? Does it, does it, by definition, include also export of different norms and practices, the export of Chinese censorship regime, for example? What does it mean in terms of data protection? Can we trust that a Chinese company can refuse Beijing's request for data access? How would they comply with certain rules if this would go against Beijing's aims? We, we already have seen in media questions about TikTok's content policies and data policies. And, uh, and a month ago, there was uh, news about Zoom suspending accounts of activists in response to uh, demands by Chinese authorities. And, and we have seen research from Canadian researchers about WeChat users abroad being subject to Chinese censorship regime. So, and, and the implications also, when we talk about TikTok, the whole potential of, of, of the censorship and, and, uh, and surveillance will, will only become clear after, after the platform has become integral part of, of internet usage for, for us or, or in our countries. And then, of course, it might be late to wean users from, from those services. So to answer all those questions and, and find suitable responses, I, I also want to make the point of cooperation, which you have also mentioned that, that you have actually talked about also in, in one of your uh, webinars, is that, that, that one reason to talk about China also in this kind of setting like today is, is that we need institutions, countries, policymakers, researchers and civil society talking to each other and working together on this issue. There is a lot of already high quality China research out there and, uh, and it would not, would not ma make sense for, for countries and governments to, to duplicate it, but rather make use of, of, of what is already out there and, and use of the, the high expertise. And, and when we talk about this information, of course, we have always said that it needs to be a, a whole society response to the problem because no government, no company, no uh, civil society actor can, can uh, do it alone. And also now on, on the EU level and, and also when we talk about like-minded countries, unity is indeed crucial uh, because only coordinated action will actually give us leverage vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, thank, thank you so much for this, um, uh, this brilliant uh, intervention. Just one question before I move to Martina. Uh, about the um, uh, about the issue that you started with the um, mm. uh, Hong Kong national security law, if you can elaborate a mm. little bit more about it uh, in terms of the actions, uh, for example, particular and in particular from the European Union, and also implications for other countries. So, uh, of course, I mean uh, the EU has uh, expressed concern, and I understand that that. Uh, that the, the Hong Kong security law, which is a, a, a very new issue and also the, the details have just emerged over the past few days. I mean, what the, what in the end the implications will be is, is, uh, is still, of course, unclear. And what the uh, kind of the, the common response of, of uh, EU countries will be, it's also difficult to say that, that uh, of course, uh, we will need to see uh, what, what uh, what will be discussed in the in the council the me meeting of foreign ministers and so on so one of the implications as i mentioned already is, is it's a very good uh, deterrent that that to, if you, if you if you want to if you if part of your bigger goal is is to deter any criticism towards your country then then of course uh, this law can can play a big part in it and of course uh, 
we will also have to see. We, we have also seen other reports that, that about the about the kind of the implications for uh, in Hong Kong that that, uh, that people have been uh, deleting their social media histories and and uh, and uh, even uh, having a sticker uh, with a sensitive message can can become grounds for for somebody's uh, arrest. The implications we have already seen are uh, very, very worrying. And of course, always this kind of precedent makes it easier for, for others to do similar things. Of course, it all, all also always very much depends on what the response kind of, what the global res- response will be. But, and we already, we also see from, from Chinese uh, kind of state media messaging that, that uh, there is a lot of this uh, comparison that, that uh, that other pe- other countries also have national security laws. Why is this? Why is this different? Or why is this? Uh, why is this not okay for us to have it? Is it Western hypocrisy? Also, when we talk about uh, talk about the impact or, or kind of how well they work, they might not work w- very well in in the Western countries or democratic countries. But uh, but some countries where minds about China are not made up yet or where there is skepticism towards the West, this message uh, might have a much more receptive audience. Yeah, thank you very much. Martina, um, if you can uh, tell us, well, first of all, about the wonderful work that Saif does, a uh, little bit, uh, like, I don't know, or five minutes as to your projects and the coverage of the world, and particularly these parts of the world, our region. And, um, and then... Uh, please let's talk about the corrosive capital, the Chinese money that comes to these countries, puts us in debt, and then basically uh, most of us are ready to do whatever it takes in order to uh, to solve the problems created by those so-called investments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me for this web talk. I remember that. <laughs> it's been really exciting to work on uh, corrosive capital. Um, it's the term that the uh, site, the Center for International Private Enterprise, coined uh, oh, already, I guess, three years ago. Um, uh, just um, uh, to introduce ourselves uh, really quickly, I will also add uh, uh, to your kind introduction at the beginning uh, that uh, we are one of four core institutes of the National Endowment for Democracy and affiliate of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We were founded in uh, 1993 on the principle that economic freedom and political freedom are linked. Um, and today our work is uh, every bit as vital as it was back then, uh, because worldwide many democracies face both internal and external challenges. And for a long time, you know, continued economic growth uh, generated tremendous opportunities uh, for all pretty much. Uh, but autocrats, including China, have uh, preyed on the openness of modern economies and, and here we are today. Um, and this is uh, especially the case with corrosive capital, which we define as capital, which originates in authoritarian regimes and lacks transparency, accountability, and market orientation. Uh, now, I, I fully agree with all the points uh, that uh, were made by Tauno. Uh, they're very relevant uh, also when it comes to the Western Balkans, but also other places where uh, site works uh, on uh, corrosive capital initiative, including Ukraine, Armenia, Moldova, some other places, and of course, um, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, but increasingly also in MENA region and Latin America. And I won't go into details uh, of, uh, of our work, but feel free to ask me any questions if you have after, after my brief uh, introductory remarks. I would like to start with general remarks on uh, what happened uh, during COVID. And of course, it should not be surprising to us because we've seen it happening before, right? The flow of state-connected investment uh, from authoritarian governments um, uh, to uh, democracies at risk has been growing exponentially for quite some time. And during COVID, uh, these governments have stepped up their efforts to the point of influencing how the public uh, in the recipient countries views authoritarian regimes. Um, though in many recipient countries, uh, the negative effects of corrosive capital on democracy, human rights, and governance are well documented. Capital uh, from these countries is largely 
portrayed favorably. Um, and it goes back again to Taunus' point uh, on information, disinformation, misinformation, uh, and, um, and the because of, uh, of uh, information influence of the authoritarian countries. I also would like to admit that while democratic countries may share interests with authoritarian governments in certain eras, including uh, combating uh, diseases, their institutional values contrast sharply. Right, um, and, and this reflects on their starkly different governance uh, systems. Capital invested by authoritarian uh, regimes, whether it's state or, or private, um, has a detrimental effect on the quality of democratic institutions. And, and so as a result, uh, the explosive growth of corrosive capital continues to be an alarming trend, we believe, and is likely a key contributor also to, um, uh, to democratic backsliding happening uh, around the world. Uh, and from this value gap that I just mentioned, arises eras of, of divergent or even conflicting interests, ranging from future shape of international rules uh, on trade uh, to the regard for human rights. Uh, and given the reality of, of these global trends, um, there, there is a need, we see a continued need for local initiatives that reduce the negative effect of corrosive capital on democratic governance. Vulnerable democracies around the world have, um, have governance gaps that are exploited and exacerbated by corrosive capital from authoritarian countries. And that's why our approach uh, to addressing um, the threat or, of corrosive capital is to identify specific gaps in the governance of the countries that receive corrosive capital from authoritarian regimes uh, and to assist our local partners in designing and implementing a response uh, to those gaps. And so by addressing this worldwide really challenge, uh, because nobody's immune to it, of corrosive capital through these very customized tailor-made programs uh, in uh, specific countries that have a local impact. We're trying to think globally, act locally uh, by creating safeguards for a democracy against uh, corrosive capital uh, in, in these countries. Uh, and I saw uh, Yago was raising hands and then I will move to Ali. Yeah, Hi, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. It's a, um, a very interesting discussion and maybe I can add also my insight from what I've been observing uh, in terms of social media because I think that's also very important. So social media like YouTube, Twitter and others took a stance that uh, in order to fight fake, fight fake news, they would uh, label or delete all information about COVID um, they would delete everything which did, did not come from the WHO. Basically saying that only information allowed is WHO information. Therefore, uh, it's a bit tricky because we have this situation when WHO is uh, accused of having, um, uh, let's say, very bad reaction. When we talk about the increasing of the Chinese, like uh, we see increase of Chinese interests in the very in the variety of the fields, in entertainment, in social media, and so on. So uh, basically. They are censoring this information, like the sensitive topics. Taiwan is the most, let's say, evident one. But otherwise, um, responses to the virus, the other things, is also very evident here. So, and but sadly, I don't see the companies doing anything to counter this. We, yes, we're talking that we should counter Chinese Communist Party, but I think uh, the infiltration has been successful on many levels. Yeah, it was mentioned that the United States is now considering to ban the TikTok, which uh, um, also there are problems with Zoom and other media um, platforms. I don't see how we, uh, we can come out of this because world has become too dependent on Chinese uh, industrial might, let's say. They will also become too dependent on the technologies uh, because of the intellectual theft, which China has been accused uh, of a long time. Yeah, In terms of, uh, let's say, technologies, we become too intertwined. So I don't see how these responses can be effective. Uh, thank you, Yago. Uh, Ani, what is uh, your assessment of the uh, 
situation. Here, Iago mentioned the um, very uh, important uh, fact of uh, implications for Georgia of all those um, uh, problems that Tauno and Martina were talking about. Um, TikTok, social media, uh, different platforms, uh, academia, uh, infiltration. What, what would you... Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tina, and greetings to everyone. Uh, I would like to first start um, with the small economic in, uh, introduction regarding China-Georgia relations. Um, I would like to mention that in the modern world, there is no geographic proximity at all, and um, China is very, very much involved in the uh, um, economic sector of Georgia, particularly Georgia, uh, like uh, the South Caucasian, uh, other South Caucasian countries as well. As Central Asian countries um, is uh, the participant of the PRI project. Uh, Georgia has signed the free trade agreement with China as well. Um, and um, I believe that uh, nah, if uh, the Western democracies um, are, are decide to restrict, limit, uh, ban, uh, or I don't know, sanction uh, Chinese companies' uh, uh, performance in their countries. Uh, I believe that in the post-COVID world, uh, their influence will grow in the developing states um, and also in Georgia as well. Um, because uh, developing states are not uh, so transparent uh, and uh, they are more open for uh, corrupt dealings or even money laundering and... Um, any other illegal actions, and that's why I believe that uh, this influence is go going to grow. Uh, as for the uh, disinformation and uh, Chinese social media platforms, uh, Huawei and 5G are already presented in Georgia, uh, and particularly in 2018, Huawei accounted for 8.76% um, of the Georgian market, and its impact is growing every year. The problem here is that uh, they are not reliable, and they have uh, the problem of content moderation as well as data privacy, like it was mentioned before. Um, just uh, to refer to one case that happened recently uh, about TikTok, uh, the users were registering on TikTok. Uh, the Russian occupied territories, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, were mentioned there as uh, independent states. Uh, of course, uh, it was noticed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Georgia, and uh, we coped with this problem immediately, but it was not um, noticed by the population, who got very attracted during the um, COVID crisis by TikTok, um, and they are still being attracted by it and entertaining themselves, um, even though such precedent happened. Um, so we believe that there is the problem of um, uh, raising awareness among the Georgian population, uh, which uh, should be analyzed and uh, um, researched and referred by the government as well as the civic uh, society. Uh, but uh, there is a problem because the um, Georgian government uh, itself uses TikTok very often and we've seen also that uh, our informal leader, uh, oligarch Mizina Ivanishvili, himself has recorded several videos on TikTok. Um, so I believe that this is a really huge problem uh, while government is supposed to raise awareness of the Georgian population uh, somebody has to raise awareness of the government as well. And as for the information space, uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, the NGO, academia and uh, media platforms in Georgia, which are also actively financed uh, by Chinese entities. Um, and uh, they are, the Chinese authorities are actively engaged in Georgia's academic wheel, both, both through official uh, university level and private channels. Uh, and uh, evidently, they focus on awareness raising about their country, its language, culture, customs, traditions, etc. Uh, 
uh, and um, they provide various grants and scholarships for students and young scholars. Uh, but they are also you know, obliging them to take a one-year Chinese language course um, in the relevant universities. Um, and uh, we fear that if uh, a decade they go on the scholarship programs available for best for performing Georgian students were in the United States and the European universities, so in the West, um, now this dynamic is going to change. Um, and uh, we will see the shifts um, among uh, the um, new generation of Georgians, so the shifts uh, uh, regarding um, their opinions and uh, uh, basically non-intelligence information is transferred to intelligence as well. And this is a very interesting feature um, that Russia does not have, for, it, for instance. Uh, as for the media, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Beijing actively invests its uh, financial and intellectual uh, resources um, by uh, sending journalists abroad uh, uh, to China and uh, uh, promoting Chinese culture and policies, um, not only through educational programs, uh, uh, but uh, through uh, media platforms uh, uh, that are financed uh, um, by them. For instance, there, is, there exists this uh, media platform called uh, Georgian Multimedia Platform for You, um, which uh, um, actually uh, promotes um, uh, uh, Ch China, Chinese propaganda, um, and uh, they also have several radios in Georgia. Uh, uh, and uh, they are inviting famous people uh, who are also promoting China um, and the journalists who uh, come uh, back from the exchange programs uh, they are uh, making reports um, on TV also in the newspaper uh, promoting uh, this uh, um, Chinese um, uh, scope uh, and uh, the Chinese Communist Party, how good is Chinese Communist Party. Uh, we are going to publish a report regarding uh, the Chinese growing, uh, China's growing influence in information space of Georgia uh, and it will be probably published in English next week. So you are all very welcome uh, to read it. Thank you, Ani. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, I just... Um wanted to um, develop on exactly this, uh, our experience, the Georgia's experience with the narratives, uh, the control of narratives. In Georgia, um, and because this webinar is at the end of the day for the use of the Georgian audience, for clarifying some issues for them, for um, making it easier to understand. Uh, if you ask even a secondary school kid in Georgia, they probably will tell you what the Russian narrative is or why Russia is doing whatever they are doing in, let's say, information space. What is it? What is the message they want to capture the hearts and minds of Georgians? What is the Chinese narrative? How can you define it? Well, today, especially in this pandemic or post-pandemic or still pandemic world, there is lots of talk about alternative narratives that China is developing or China, Russia, Chinese Russian propaganda machinery is developing and then the one uh, which is out there in the Western world. But as it was already said, there are lots of countries, Tauna was saying it and Georgia definitely is one of those, lots of countries where um, concepts are not clear, definitions are not clear. The Maoism is somehow considered to be a superior, more interesting, attractive, effective than the Leninism. So what is this narrative? How would you define it? Um, what is the China trying to tell to the world as their story that needs to be pinned in our minds and uh, in our... Understanding? Well, uh, one... Uh one thing, of course, is 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 uh, is, uh, is to legitimize their system to show how well it works uh, for solving problems like the pandemic, for example. To uh, to show, especially to show comparably how well it works, and and the comparison moment then is kind of the so so the first one would be the positive. The, 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 the positive messages about China, how, how, how China is doing well, how it's 
especially during the COVID pandemic, how it was a responsible, transparent actor that um, that sacrificed that that made a sacrifice to to save the rest of the world from the worst of the pandemic. Now, as time goes on, of course. Uh, we see a lot of also uh, then then the other part with the negative side of the messaging would be then the anti-US messages that you see a lot currently uh, on on Chinese uh, state-controlled media, for example, how highlighting all the, uh, highlighting uh, problems uh, in the US uh, encountering the, the pandemic, uh, then. Um, Dividing the world into into two in a way, and and saying that whoever criticizes China, whoever is 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 negative towards China, is playing the game of the United States. That it's uh, that it's it's so so basically all criticism towards China is political, politicized, and it's the United States game that people are are playing when they when they are doing this. And of course now the third. Uh, additional thing that we are seeing also is a new new strand of of this kind of uh, spreading conspiracy theory rumors and and untruth. These are also often tied to the to the anti-US messaging. I think these are I, I would guess the, the three bigger strands at, at the moment. Uh, Martina, why why is China doing all of that? What's the only <laughs> so eloquently mentioned to us? And talk That's about. what I was just thinking. Exactly, there is a lot of research. Like Tano said, there's so a lot of research on mm-hmm. on these topics available, right? And so some would say it's because um, the Communist Party uh, needs to uh, needs to make sure um, that it sustains its revenue flows. Or um, some other uh, experts would tell you that it's because China needs uh, more resources, and so that's why it needs to um, uh, needs to exp- expand uh, foreign countries. Uh, then others would add to that that it's because China wants to exert its influence when it comes to the Balkans, specifically. For example, um, uh, some experts would uh, would then uh, assert that it's because China uh, wants to uh, make sure that it has allies at the EU table. Uh, for it, uh, for the time after the Balkan uh, countries entered the European Union, but we also uh, at Cyben together with our partners, we like to talk about really what are the consequences of uh, Chinese uh, economic uh, diplomacy in the Balkans. Just to give you a very specific example, because of the debt trap diplomacy that China's um, using uh, in the region, uh, there may be severe consequences. Uh, for the Western Balkan countries, uh, European integration uh, perspective, right? As as their uh, public debts are are growing, uh, they may eventually uh, have problems meeting uh, the European uh, Union uh, accession criteria. So that's one of the topics that SIP is planning uh, to look um, uh, in the in the coming year. Um, so for the public uh, to understand. Also for the decision makers, because it's not always the case that the decision makers, so elected representatives, understand um, uh, the extent uh, of of the consequences uh, of engaging uh, with uh, Chinese uh, capital, or, but also other corrosive uh, capital uh, coming from authoritarian countries. Um, so uh, there, there are um, many reasons behind. We, we believe, many believe, and I, I just wish we had Martin Hala here on this panel, our dear friend from the Czech Republic, who who, who has written uh, tons uh, on these issues, right? Um, on the on on the, the objectives of, uh, of Chinese um, diplomacy abroad. Uh, but again, we, we like to talk also about the consequences and um, and um, and help really the the decision makers. Uh, in the countries that are receiving corrosive capital to make responsible decisions that are um, to the to the benefit of their citizens. I also wanted to uh, wanted to follow up on uh, some of the points that Lago and uh, Ani made. Um, I fully agree um, uh, to the points that you made uh, specifically on on the private sector. Um, I, I wanted to say that, of course, um, it's very likely that the private sector will play a significant role also in post-COVID uh, recovery and reconstruction. But on the other hand, uh, you have others who argue that 
The crisis has clearly demonstrated the need for states increasing role in economy. Um, so uh, the time will show um, uh, how, how uh, this will uh, unfold. Uh, but I would definitely like to stress uh, that um, investors often, so the private companies often assert their own business culture, expectations of conduct and norms of business uh, and other behavior through their investments, uh, right? And so it's extremely important that the private sector plays also its own constructive role in, um, in uh, dealing with, uh, with the corrosive capital. Um, the, we've seen unprecedented economic growth uh, over the past 30 years. Um, but we are currently at the, let's say, inflection point when the growth is slowing um, and, um, and the businesses must play a positive role in reducing corruption, not being part of the problem, improving their own governance, and that way also uh, reducing inequality uh, through generational wealth uh, for a greater and wider number of, of citizens. Because that's what citizens ultimately care about, right? Uh, we spoke about narratives of Russia uh, and China, right, uh, and how uh, the public perceives uh, these two um, uh, stakeholders. Well, uh, when it comes to economy or economic benefit, an average citizen typically cares for the price of the product, right? And, and that's where, where China has had for a considerable um, um, period of time significant advantage because of the prices they offer for their products whether it's just iPhones, you know, or anything else. And it goes also to um, Annie's point on the issues um, around data privacy. Digital economy has been growing uh, tremendously. Uh, and, uh, and it, again, brought not only uh, opportunities, uh, but it, it um, you know, uh, posed also certain uh, challenges. It, it happened, the growth of uh, digital economy, happen in parallel with the growth of mobile internet penetration, for example. And, and again, and now, we, now we see the consequences, right? Uh, we um, specifically look at some of these issues uh, with our partners in South um, East Asia and release the report um, around uh, digital economy and uh, uh, digital privacy and privacy rights uh, earlier this year. Um, it's, uh, it's on our uh, webpage uh, of corrosivecapital.org. Um, so feel free um, to uh, to uh, skim through it at least. There's a lot of really interesting information uh, um, that our partners in Southeast Asia uh, put together. Moving forward, we specifically also want to at site start engaging the private sector to promote their vigilance about state-directed, let's say, attempts to use digital technology for geopolitics and surveillance. And then hopefully, eventually, uh, we'll, we'll be able to, um, to create, let's say, coalitions of private sector stakeholders, including businesses, who will be more aware of what it takes to do business um, with, uh, with private companies uh, that may not be so private from authoritarian regimes, right? Because the, the lines between uh, public and private are blurred um, in those countries. So we will want to work with them. Um, uh, to make sure that they have strong, for example, compliance um, uh, procedures and structures in place and, and, and behave um, uh, in an ethical way so they, they conduct their business with integrity and so that uh, they, they will eventually opt for, um, for partnerships with um, capital, which we at site uh, call constructive. Um, so the type of capital that um, that is transparent, is market oriented, um, and um, and uh, helps uh, pretty much everybody uh, to grow, um, uh, including uh, the local populations in in the countries um, of of the investment, uh, which includes also, of course, compliance with labor and environmental regulations, which is oftentimes problem. Uh, speaking of uh, Chinese investment, I would like just to um, close um, my remarks uh, on this by saying that we've seen some positive examples, right, of uh, some countries rethinking their approach uh, to um, corrosive or constructive capital um, or their approach uh, to, uh, to the choices they make 
Recently, we've seen news from Romania uh, that canceled deal with China to build nuclear reactors uh, in Romania. Then we, we saw news uh, uh, from the Czech Republic on the declaration between Czechs and the United States on their co uh, collaboration on uh, 5G, right? So there have been some positive examples of, uh, of um, uh, elected representatives um, making some really responsible decisions. And uh, I will leave it there. Uh, thank you, but uh, I cannot um, let you go before you, before we, we want to touch one more issue. You were talking uh, exactly in that direction. Uh, and uh, in post-COVID world, it is absolutely uh, clear that the world is going to need much more money, much more capital, constructive capital uh, for... Um, for repairing the damage uh, that the world is facing right now for these last three months, and we don't even know what's going to happen in next three months or after that. Where is that money going to come from? Um, what is the source that the world expects? Out of the expectation of exactly the point you you started this uh, intervention with, uh, the tremendous uh, economic, unprecedented economic growth of China over the last 30 years, there is an expectation that most money is there. And the free, sort of free money is there, the money which is uh, not free from the political interference, but which is not booked yet for other engagements and also will be used for the benefit of the uh, uh, CCR as well as the whole the narrative that we were talking about, the controlled narrative of China for not only proving that they were effective medically in fighting COVID, but also they are effective in helping the rest of the world to come out of this crisis. What should be the um, strategy that I believe must be already out there from the democracies um, is to counter the effects uh, of that big money intervention, if it happens or when it happens uh, during the crisis in, again yeah. in the West? That, that, that's a really uh, good question. Um, and I, I'll start by saying that, you know, we've seen so many countries that came together and helped others who, who you know, when, when was the right time to do it, uh, supported them in so many ways, whether financially or uh, with the equipment um, and, and provision of services. They, many of them did this bilaterally, didn't even make um, uh, bold headlines, uh, unlike some other countries, um, of course. And again, there are reasons, um, I guess, uh, why, why this assistance was not uh, covered uh, equally. And it's not only the issue of, uh, of the media outlets that are owned by authoritarian uh, countries, but it's also a problem of uh, these countries using, uh, um, you know, local media outlets, but also private companies as vehicles of their influence. But it's also true, and, and somebody already pointed out to this, that uh, COVID is a global challenge. It remains to be seen how it will uh, evolve, uh, but we should prepare for, uh, for the worst. And it requires a global or in other words, coordinated response. So global cooperation, inclusive multilateralism and innovative partnerships uh, to stop the pandemic, limit the impact and, and redefine societies and economies uh, as well as prepare for the future are extremely important. Yeah, it's also true that these countries are members of, um, uh, of uh, the most important uh, and what should be the most influential, impactful international organizations. Take the example of EBRD, speaking of Europe, for example, where China, for example, has certain percentages of shares, right? So it's it's really a difficult uh, question, uh, but we, we've seen very clearly that Beijing um, tried to use um, the, the pandemic to shore up its support for states with budget shortfalls, and, and may eventually even go in some places. It might have already started on a buying spree. I, I'd like to quote uh, um, the Heritage Foundation's uh, James Carafano on this one. So he said uh, recently that if we don't bail out these countries uh, in need, what will happen is that Chinese will just move in and they will uh, seize their assets and be even more 
um, influential and make these countries dependent uh, on China than before. So specifically on the role of international financial institutions, one very important point uh, to make is that we have to be careful uh, about multilateral institutions to make sure that their funding is not used to pay off uh, Chinese loans, for example, right? Just to give you a very specific example of how uh, multilateral uh, funding uh, could be, uh, you know, used to the detriment of, of democratic uh, values and economic uh, market economic principles. And so the efficacy really of the support will depend on our efforts to ensure transparency around uh, multilateral uh, relief as well as the details of China deals by making them an explicit subject of discussion in bilateral and multilateral strategic dialogues. Uh, various stakeholders can sharpen their approach with sustained promotion of greater transparency and rules-based transactions. That's where I would leave it at. Of course, um, it's not going to be easy. I, I believe Tauno discussed uh, at the beginning uh, that um, states need to need to make up their minds about until when they will want to try keep engaging China um, and get it on board uh, with democratic um, you know governance uh, principles um, and I don't want to comment on then on that when it's the right time to say that um, enough is enough uh, but yeah that's one of the very important questions that I, I believe um, the leaders uh, at the European Union, though NATO, also NATO and other organizations um, are, you know, discussing and, and, and keep them awake at night. Thank you, Martina. We actually had a very interesting comment about this Enough is Enough by the General Hodges in one mm -hmm. of our uh, discussions, which I won't repeat as well, because the prediction was not very positive and optimistic as to what happens after uh, world will understand that enough is enough. Uh, but um, yeah, thank you for the for that contribution, Tauno. Maybe the um, final word goes to you, and um, we are actually um, uh, coming up to the end of this, this wonderful discussion. Yes, there's actually it's a very interesting discussion, and I would have a lot of questions to to Annie and and uh, and Martina. Um, but yes, so I mean, also if you look at the EU EU strategic kind of uh, work plans, then, then Green Deal is, is one of the pillars of, of, uh, of European Commission's uh, next five years. So, so one way or another, we have to talk to China, but, but yes, whether, it's, uh, whether there's any hope in, to, for, for a kind of um, democratic um, change, that's, that's another issue. I mean, it's more probably it, we have to be realistic in what we expect and, and uh, can achieve uh, and, and of course I mean in the end ultimately have to protect our democracies and our dem democratic values um, but also I, I think it, in the end uh, I think that I also want to end on a hopeful note is that, that I see that at least there is uh, understanding of the problem uh, among, uh, among the policymakers and, 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 and EU countries but of course, uh, with a country like China, there's always uh, the balance, the balancing of short-term and long-term interests, and and uh, where it falls with one or the other country, of course, that's a that's a separate uh, issue. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Martina uh, Tauno and Ani for for this uh, uh, very interesting and um, uh, very useful uh, discussion. Uh, as I have said in the beginning, it ends our a uh, series of web talks uh, that we started uh, in mid-April, uh, but it does not end obviously our activities and we will be coming with uh, more uh, issues and more uh, public discussions before we will be able to meet in person. I want to express my um, absolute gratitude to all the speakers we had uh, during these 10 webinars, uh, very um, outstanding people, uh, colleagues, friends of Georgia, uh, who devoted their time uh, and uh, gave their uh, interesting and important uh, comments and thoughts about the issues that we were discussing from uh, so many different countries, uh, from so many different professions and uh, so many different uh, parts of government or 
uh, think tanks and uh, non-governmental sector or the media world. Uh, thank you to all of you. We will be um, reproducing all the videos that we have from our web talks uh, during these times. And, uh, and once again, we hope that we will meet in person soon and these uh, difficult times will be over.